It's great to have my daughter Karis in town from Chicago for spring break. I hold her responsible for this weather. <laughs> Many of you know that she attends Trinity International University, but you may not know that she actually attends our former church in Evanston, and she is a integral part of that church and serves in a variety of ways. There are some significant differences, not theological, but there are significant differences between my last church and this church. For example, my last church is filled with college students. This church, not so much. <laughs> you may not believe this, but my last church, size about like this, urban church, no parking. Can you imagine a size of a church like this? No parking? How would you like to go to that church? Yeah. Another significant difference is that we own this wonderful building. And in the 30 plus years of my last church, we have never owned a building. In fact, while I was there, we were in three different locations. For two years, we were at the movie theater, moving in and out every single Sunday. And for the last eight years, we've met in the uh, Music Institute of Chicago, which is a beautiful $9 million building that we would meet in every single Sunday. But my first four years there, we were actually permanently in the basement of an old Marshall Fields. Remember that store? <laughs> yeah, downtown area of Evanston, and above us was a Panera Restaurant. And in that location, we had a variety of problems, specifically with a lot of flooding, when it would rain hard, water would just pour in to our sanctuary and to our offices. Sometimes during uh, the service, when we'd be singing or preaching, we would have liquids from Panera fall down on top of us. They would spill a drink and we would get baptized. <laughs> and we would work to repair these problems. We would work hard and then a rain would come and would flood us again. We would work hard to repairing all these problems and then the liquids would fall on top of us. And it was, a, it was an amazing loop that kept going on. Our pattern was fix something, then something else breaks. Fix something, then something else breaks. It, it was a very taxing and discouraging time where we thought, here we go again. And all of us have experienced Seasons like this, you work hard at fixing something and it falls apart over again. Maybe you have a relationship that's been very difficult and you've worked hard at it. And just when you think it's, it's all worked out, there is a huge blow up. Here we go again. Or maybe you've been fighting the same pains and illness for a long time and you've been pushing through, seeing a variety of doctors, and just when you think you're feeling better, it comes back. Here we go again. Or maybe you've been fighting against some sin and you have accountability, you're in the Word, you're in community, and then you slip back. Here we go again. I mean, the first time was hard. The second time was grueling. But now you're at a part where you're like, I don't know if I can do this again. And I want to give up. And some of you are there right now. You're at that I want to give up phase. You're worn out, you're tired, and it's getting old. And you want to quit. Well, I'm glad you're here. Because this morning we're going to talk about faithfulness. As we've been going through the fruit of the Spirit, we have seen these virtues, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and now faithfulness. And we all need faithfulness. There's a variety of ways to explain faithfulness. Faith is, faithfulness is this enduring faith in action. But my emphasis for today, I'm going to put it up on the screen for you, is faithfulness is the ability to endure in the midst of here-we-go-again circumstances. 
Faithfulness is the ability to endure in the midst of here we go again circumstances. And this morning we're going to look at a group of people from the Word of God who were in a here we go again situation. As we see their story in Hebrews chapter 10, it's a group of believers that after they became Christians, they underwent severe persecution. But they were firm in their faith. But it seems as if the trials had lingered or intensified and they weren't looking so good the second time around. In fact, some of the Hebrews were considering bailing on the Christian faith because the persecution and the trials were just too much. They needed endurance. Let's just start with verse 36. Verse 36. You have need of endurance. You can underline that if you want. You may not be considering bailing on your faith, but like some of the Hebrews, you may need to be faithful, continue to do the will of God. You have need of endurance. And the way that they are going to be encouraged to endure in faithfulness is the same way I'm going to encourage you this morning. You see, they are encouraged to endure with this little flashback action and a flash uh, forward action. I don't know if you ever watch TV shows, right? Where they have these flashbacks to what happened in the past. And sometimes they have these flash forwards to the future. So we're going to take on a journey this morning to a, a flashback to your faithfulness and a flash forward to your reward. A flashback to your faithfulness, and a flash forward to your reward. Let's start back with a flashback to your faithfulness in verse 32. Look at verse 32. But remember the former days when after being enlightened, you endured a great great conflict of sufferings. The author is intentionally calling them to remember the early days of their conversion and faithfulness. Yes, of course, God was faithful through them, but he wants them to reflect on their faithfulness and their faithful actions as they endured a great conflict of suffering. Look at verse 33. Partly by being made a public spectacle through reproaches and tribulations, and partly by becoming sharers with those who were so treated, For you showed sympathy to the prisoners and accepted joyfully the seizure of your property, knowing that you have for yourselves a better possession and a lasting one. Perhaps this is believers in Christ who are Jews have been converted and they're being persecuted by fellow Jews. Or maybe this is the Roman persecution in AD 49 under Claudius. And whichever group is behind the persecution, it's not clear, but we can see some of the details in their suffering. Look again at verse 33. Looks like they were made a public spectacle through reproaches and tribulation. The language here is similar to someone up on a stage in front of everyone. As the Hebrew Christians were on the stage of the world, they were ridiculed and persecuted for their faith in Christ. Just as Jesus Christ was publicly insulted and physically beaten leading up to his crucifixion. Now it was falling on these early Christians as they were publicly insulted and persecuted. Even when it didn't happen to them personally, they would attach themselves to those who were persecuted, as we see again in verse 33. It says that they were sharers with those who were so treated. If a Christian was thrown into jail they would go and visit them. And it even says that to a point, their stuff was plundered. It was confiscated due into them being a Christian. Maybe it was stolen while they were in jail. Or maybe someone came along from the Roman government government and took it. But it didn't bother them, as it says specifically in verse 34, that they were full of joy and accept it joyfully, the seizure of your property. I don't know about you, but I I could not do that. But I want to be able to do that, right? Taking my stuff, I have joy in the Lord. 
It didn't bother them. They had joy because they knew they had better and lasting possessions in Christ in heaven. Now, this kind of, of faithfulness we see here requires a certain mentality. Look again at verse 32. Verse 32 says, But remember the former days, when after being enlightened, you endured a great conflict of suffering. Notice the word conflict. Another appropriate translation would be battle or contest. The Greek word behind this is where we get our word athletics. It's used here to show how they aggressively stood firm in their faith in the midst of suffering. They had a battle mentality. One scholar put it like this, that they didn't suffer passively as a criminal, but they suffered as an athlete. They did not take on a victim mentality that just sits passively by and is swept away by the punishment, and then they end up denouncing their faith. They were like an athlete that kept standing firm in Christ and not renouncing their faith. They had this battle mentality. And I really think this athletic imagery is appropriate for the Christian life because if you don't understand that the Christian life is a battle, and by the way, it always will be until we're with Jesus. We'll be battling and fighting until we're with the Lord. And if we don't understand that it's this battle mentality and this athletic imagery, we will fall into a victim mentality where you end up blaming your problems or someone or something else. I don't know if there's anybody here like that, but you are a master at blame shifting. You're saying, well, the reason why I sin or the reason why I got angry or the reason why I did that is it's someone else's fault. Maybe... It's your parents' fault, or your co-workers' fault, or your friends' fault. But the best scapegoat is always your spouse. (laughs) It's always their fault for why I did what I did. And it's this victim mentality that will do you in. Because the problem is always somewhere out there and never in here. And you may argue, say, Pastor, but if they weren't there, I would not do that. Well, something was in you, and they just drew it out. But not the Hebrews. They weren't playing the victim. They would get beat up for their faith. They had their stuff taken, and they were thrown in prison. Yet they kept on spiritually battling I want to say something a little odd to you today. I want to tell you that you are not a victim, but you are an athletic child of God. You are not a victim, but you are an athletic child of God. Who cares if you don't have an ounce of athleticism? You are a spiritual athletic child of God with the power of the Holy Spirit living through you which means that you can battle in the midst of your suffering rather than playing the victim. Do not be the victim who points the finger elsewhere, but you can spiritually battle and spiritually press on. So stop this blame shifting and start being an athletic child of God and do a little reflection on your past faithfulness. I bet there was a time in your life that you you, you may have we're really serious about the Lord. You reflect back on your path faithfulness to get into the word and prayer. Your past faithfulness to, to battle for purity. Your, your past faithfulness to share in the gospel and showing compassion and, and giving money and on and on again. You had this past faithfulness. And when we throw stuff up, it says, come on, eat, love, pray. In the past, you would have been all over that. Golf, love, pray. Oh, that's in your alley for sure. You're going to get out there and you're going to share the gospel. Hike, love, pray. That used to be you. You would have been all over this. What has happened? You see how we, we need this continuing on in faithfulness. And one of the ways we can do that, we can look backwards and go, you know, back in the day, man, I was, I was seriously following Jesus. I was pressing on in faithfulness. I was sharing the gospel. I was praying for people to get saved. I was showing compassion. What has happened? Look back at your past faithfulness. 
Yes, God was faithful through you, but you were faithful as well. That's what the author is trying to get the Hebrews to see. Look at your past faithfulness. But he also wants them to flash forward to the reward. To flash forward to the reward. In order to be faithful, look backwards and look forward. So let's look at this little flash forward to your reward in verse 35. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward. Now, this exhortation to the Hebrews is to retain the same confident faith in the Lord that they had in the past. It's, it's about their confident faith. And the reward is, hey, only in Jesus can you have forgiveness of sins. Only in Jesus can you have access to the Father. Only in Jesus can you have eternal life. Do not throw away your confidence in Jesus. Despite all that you may be going through and some things that you may lose now, you will be rewarded now and for eternity. And this great reward and all that it entails is centered on Jesus Christ. Jesus is your reward now. Jesus is your reward for eternity. And let me tell you this. You are not battling to gain the reward of Jesus, but you battle because he is already your reward through faith. You're not trying to work your way to him. You have salvation by grace through faith. And since you already have Jesus, you press on in faithfulness. He is your reward. Verse 36, for you have need of endurance so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. They may have thought that their greatest need was to have their suffering alleviated. But according to this, their greatest need was to press on in doing the will of God. They were to remain faithful to Jesus and to continue to love their brothers and sisters. And your great need is to press on in the will of God. I mean, really, you may think your greatest need is healing, and you can pray for that. You may think your greatest need is for your adult children to encourage you and to support you, and that's great to, to pray for that. You may think that your greatest need is a, a, a better marriage, and that's great. You can, you can pray for that. You may think that your greatest need is just to be comfortable and secure in life, but your greatest need is to press on and doing the will of God. Even when your marriage is crazy and your body seems to be falling apart, your greatest need is to press on and doing the will of God. And too often, when things start to be crashing down on us, we can be tempted, like the Hebrews, to bail. Someone once said, we live in this uh, disposable culture. We have disposable paper plates, disposable razors, disposable diapers, and contact lenses, and phones, and computers, and TVs, so some things aren't working. Well... Let's start, let's start brand new and dispose. And sometimes we can get this mentality with weightier things. If relationships are not working, eh, we can dismiss them. And a classic one in our day and age is that if the church isn't doing things exactly the way I want them to do things, bye-bye church, I'm going to go find another one. And maybe you've made some commitments in your life that are getting really hard and challenging. And in our day and age, we bail on our commitments as well. It's this disposable culture. But you may fail to see, and I'm sure you do see it, but you may fail to see that in these areas, when we're making these throwing away stuff, bailing on stuff, we could be disposing of the will of God. And your greatest need is to press on in doing the will of God. And when this life is up and you have done the will of God by grace through faith, you will receive what was promised. And your reward is Christ and with Christ forever. 
We'll finish up with this flash forward in verses 37 through 39. For yet in a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back to destruction, but of those who have faith to the preserving of the soul. This quote here is a combination of Isaiah 26.20 and Habakkuk 2, 3, and 4. And the gist here is that the Hebrews were under great trials that they were understand that Jesus was going to soon come back. In fact, he will come back and not delay, which means that these trials will not last forever. In fact, we can say that your trial has an expiration date. I guarantee you, those of you who have faith in Jesus Christ, your trial would not last forever. Whatever you're going through, it will end eventually. It has an expiration date. And this is not time for the righteous to mess around with a lack of unfaithfulness to the will of God. And the author, which is interesting, the author is confident that they won't shrink back. He's confident they'll press on to be with the Lord one day. He speaks with confidence because he has observed their past fruitfulness and faithfulness to persevere. And he's seen them diligent and loving one another and their brothers and sisters. And I'm confident in you as well. Perhaps you just need a little encouragement today. But I've seen your faithfulness. I've seen you push through difficulties. I've seen you hang in there in tough relationships. And I've seen you press on in faithfulness. And you just need to continue to look back to your past faithfulness and look forward to your reward and keep going. And sometimes in churches, things can get tough. I just think about our last church when we were uh, in the basement. Man, we were, we were physically falling apart. And I noticed the church, they were faithful. Through all of our moves and location changes, the people were faithful. I remember all the adjustments we had to make just to pull off the worship service. So water would be gushing through the ceiling. I mean, sometimes that deep in the sanctuary, and people would work through the night to clean it up so we could worship the next morning. Some Sundays, we would be without AC in the basement in the summer and fans will be brought in. No heat in the winter, and heaters will be brought in. Concrete falling through the ceiling in the children's room, and helmets will be brought in. I'm kidding about that one. There's no helmets brought in. <laughs> You're like, really? You see, people kept pressing on in faithfulness and pulling things off. And I've seen the same. I've only been here six months, and I've seen the same thing here at BBC. In fact, you guys have been faithful over 30 years. You have pressed on with faithfulness because you know that Christ is your reward now and your reward forever. But personally speaking, a little flashback to your faithfulness. Flash forward to your reward. And I'm going to end by asking you, uh, you maybe may make you feel a little uncomfortable, but I'm going to ask you to single out one area of your life to press on in faithfulness. Maybe it's an area where you've been kind of flaky. I don't know if you know that word or ever used that word, flaky, but basically it means not following through. It means slacking off or abdicating your responsibilities. And maybe there's a certain area where you have slacked off. You haven't followed through. And maybe you've quit. And you need to move from being flaky to being faithful. So I'm asking you to narrow it down to that one area of your life where you've kind of quit. Maybe... You've stopped leading yourself. And you've been a little flaky with yourself and your relationship with the Lord. You really, back in the day, used to get in the Word, used to pray, but you've been slacking off. Move from flaky to faithfulness in your relationship with the Lord and prayer and, and time in the Word. 
Maybe you've been a little flaky at church. You used to be involved in church, but some of you come here to the village, you're like, I did all my service for the last 50 years in that church up north somewhere, right? And you come here and you're like, don't ask me to do anything. I mean, really, do you think you, you, when you retire, you're like, oh, God's like, oh, I'll give them a pass. They don't have to serve in church. It's okay. they've, already, they've already done it. That's okay. I give them a pass. No, he doesn't give you a pass. Are you still alive? No pass. You need to be faithful. You need to be faithful. And maybe, to get really personal, it, it is, maybe it's an area of sin. Or back in the day, you're like, you're an athletic child of God. You had your dukes up. You're like fighting and boxing sin, but it just kind of wears on you, and you got your guard down, and you're giving in more than not. Maybe it's time to get your guard back up and engage in the battle. And I know one of the most difficult is when your body starts to fail you. And when, you, when your body starts to go and it's not doing what you want it to and things are painful, there can be these temptations to lash out at God, lash out at others. Maybe it's time to press through even the severe pain. And maybe you can't do what you once were able to do, but you can still pray. You can still be grateful. You can still press on in doing the will of God. So where do you need to move from being flaky to faithful? Do a little flashback action this morning to your former faithfulness and look forward to your reward. And now's the time by God's grace, by his Holy Spirit, because we're talking about the fruit of the Spirit. It's not about your ability. It's not about your inability. It's about your dependence on the Lord to produce his faithfulness through you. Where is it you need to submit again to move from flakiness to faithfulness? By God's grace, walk in it. Let's pray. Lord, we just thank you so much for your faithfulness to us. You're actually even faithful when we're faithless. But you have saved us by your grace. You have filled us with your spirit. And even when we feel the same temptations as the Hebrew Christians did about bailing, may we not bail. May we continue on. And I pray for that man or woman in here right now who feels like they are in a struggle against sin. And they want to leave their guard down, give them the strength to enter the battle again and to continue to fight by your grace. And I pray for my brothers and sisters who are hurting in their relationships and in their bodies. And they get so angry or discouraged. Please enable them in faithfulness to hope in you, in faithfulness to praise you, in faithfulness to persevere another day. And Lord, what is so good about you? You're not telling us to press on tomorrow. You're just calling us to be faithful today. In fact, you tell us not to worry about tomorrow. It's got plenty of troubles to deal with today. So Lord, enable us to press on with faithfulness today by your grace, by the filling of your Holy Spirit, all to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen.